All right, welcome. I can see uh, all of you joining us from the waiting room. Uh, super excited to take you on this Miyazaka Brewing Company virtual tour and tasting. Uh, we've got Keith Norum, we've got Nakano Toji, and we have our good friend Katsuhiku Miyazaka to, uh, to spend some time with us as well. So as you can see here, this is a Norin. These two Japanese characters say Masumi. This is the brand name. You'll see it on a lot of our products, um, but it's not actually the company name. Uh, like many small to medium sake breweries, the company name is the name of the family that owns the brewery. So for Masumi, it is Miyazaka is the family name, and they've been making Masumi sake since 1662. And yes, uh, if you didn't know that, that's three years before New York's New Amsterdam became New York City. <laughs> so the family uh, that that runs this this beautiful brewery uh, is in the middle. We have the president Naotaka Miyazaka, uh, and right next to him is his son Katsuhiko, which we'll be meeting in a little bit later. And then, of course, on the other side is the most important person, Kumi, who's uh, Katsuhiko's mom and Naotaka's boss, I mean, uh, his wife, uh, but <laughs> we all know that he's actually, she's actually the real boss. Uh, just keep that under, under wraps, keep it quiet. Um, so Japan, let's look where Masumi is actually located. Okay? So as you can see, that star in the middle is Suwa. That's where, where it is. And you can see Tokyo highlighted uh, wow, on the right. Um, it's very important about where small sake brewers are because where you are is who you are it really the local environment the food culture really drives and impacts the sake that you make uh super important that part yeah. so obviously here you can see all of japan you can see the the sea of japan and and from over in in china you get a lot of cold air which brings a ton of snow again as you saw in our initial advertisements uh nanago is known as the roof of japan so they get massive amounts of snowfall um as you can see, uh, we're right in the middle, smack dab in the middle. Um, and again, we know about the Olympics, but okay, so here's Nagano. Uh, when most people travel to Japan, they land in Tokyo, uh, right? So you, you see where Tokyo is. And then we can take a train all the way uh, to Yamanashi and we pass Mount Fuji. The beautiful view on your left side is that wonderful Mount Fuji. Just as we get to Kofu, um, you'll be able to see uh, on the left, you'll be able to see the, the second largest mountains, which is the Southern Alps. Wow. And then you also, to the right, as you start to move up to Suwa, you see eight peaks range. Um, so we're right in between these, these mountains where you're getting lots of snow. Um, your train threads through these two mountains on your way to Suwa. And then once you get to Suwa, right, you're now in this beautiful high elevation town, one of the highest places where sake is actually made. Um, but let's take another look at Suwa Basin from another point of view. So this is an early morning view. Yep, that little thing in the distance is Mount Fuji. So Lake Suwa is right there, as you can see it. And then again, off in the distance, you see our wonderful uh, Mount Fuji. To the right, you have the Southern Alps. To the left, you have the Eight Peaks Range. And again, Lake Suwa is surrounded by several small towns instead of including Kami. Um, and then Suwa and Shima in the lower. Suwa is on the left, as you can see it. And that's where the Kura is that was originally opened in 1662. Um, in 1980, they built a second uh, brewery up in the mountains uh, in Fujimi. Uh, today, we're going to start by talking with Katsuhiku Miyazaka, who is standing by at the Suakura, and then we'll move up to Fujimi Kura to be with our tour leader, Keith Norm, and the master brewery, uh, Nakano Toji. Yeah. So, here we go. Let's check in with Suakura. Hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for the, the introduction of the Nagano and also the, my brewery. Uh, my name is Katsuhiko Miyazaka, the next generation of the, this brewery. And uh, today, uh, I will introduce uh, the short course of the, the, this uh, old brewery, Suwakura. And uh, I want you to see the, the, our new, you know, the symbol mark of our Masumi brand. <laughs> yeah, we just, you know, the, replaced the new Noland to this. Yeah, and maybe the kids, 
Mm. Thank you. The kids will be maybe uh, explain. Uh, you know, he is gonna explain what this symbol marks meaning later. Uh, because you know, we also put uh, this symbol mark to the new here owners label too. Mm. So please go inside of the brewery. So this is the uh, entrance uh, to the brewery. So today, uh, our master brewer, uh, Toji Nakano, he's gonna uh, speak about this product, right? Yaoroshi? Yes. Mm. So as you can see, uh, we have the new symbol mark in the central part you know, of this new level. And there actually, it's a time, uh, not for the Hiroshi in Japan. I know it's coming to New York City and also the other cities in the US about this time, but there, it's time for Alaba City in Japan. So the, this is actually the new level of the Alaba City. It's coming soon uh, to the US uh, in two or three months, right, CJ? Yes, yes, exactly. Yep. Beautiful. Yeah, so everybody's kind of excited uh, and also being kind of busy for the, you know, shipping uh, Alaba City to the market right now, as you can see like that. Very so uh, we changed uh, not just the label, but also the sake itself too. Uh, maybe somebody, uh, the, most of the people notice, you know, that the we changed that, you know, kind of like, you know, the taste of the whole Masumi sake in past three, four years. Uh, mm -hmm. I came back to, you know, this Masumi brewery about six, seven years ago. So since that time, I'm trying to use, you know, uh, our original ingredient, which is the yeast, you know, the one of the most famous history about our brewery is, this is uh, actually the original origin place uh, where the number seven yeast was actually found. Uh, in Japanese, we call it uh, Nanago Kobo, and uh, which can be, you know, translated to the East Number Seven. And this, you know, the thing said, this is the bus price of the, the East Number Seven. Super cool. That's very important yeah. yeast in the production of sake. It's it's the most commonly used yeast in all of sake production. So uh, we're very very happy that you found it. Yeah. Uh, as you said right now, you know, a, a lot of people, they use or know, uh, you know, number seven is, you know, I mean, the other breweries in all over Japan. But when I come back to here, Masumi, uh, actually, our main product was made with not the number seven, like number nine or number 18, you know, those kind of like modern is. So uh, I thought, you know, uh, to make it, you know, uh, of a blunt, you know, the, the profile, well, how can I say, the items, you know, more simple. Uh, right. I thought it's better to, you know, just use number seven for the old product, you know, from Masumi. Which is fantastic. So uh, is, that, is that all the brewery we see today? And we're gonna, or is it time to go say hello to Keith? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll pass my button to Keith, you know, um, he'll be in the Fujimi right now. Awesome. Thank you very much. And we'll see you later. And hopefully you'll hang around the chat to answer people's yep. questions. Uh, really good to see you. And thank you for sharing your brewery with us. Yeah. Thank you. And enjoy your tour. Thank you very much. We're looking good. forward to it. Hey, can, can you see me, CJ? Yep. I can see you. You're live. You're good. All righty. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, pardon me. I have to shout because we're up here in the mountains. I think CJ mentioned, this is the highest elevation brewery in Japan. It's uh, almost a thousand meters, which is, uh, what is that? It's getting close to, you know, uh, 7,000 feet or something like that. So it's quite a high place to, to make some sake. We don't have much time left, so I'm going to take a real quick run through the whole brewing process. We're actually making sake today, so you get a chance to see at least a little bit of that, okay? First, this is the mountains. We're going to pan around here, and as we do that, you see our shrine, and then you get here. That's the uh, Masumi train. What? All breweries have trains, right? No, this is, this is Grandpa Miyazaka's um, uh, plaything. Oh. He loves this train. And if we come around here, that's the brewery. So that's Fujimi Brewery. It's a little bit backlit, but you're still okay? You with me? Yep, we're all here. Cool. So away we go. We're going to take a look at our polishing plant. This is where we mill the rice. 
one of the few sake makers in Nagano that has its own polishing operation. What happens is we get our rice. Say hi. Domo. Domo. <laughs> we get our rice mostly from Nagano Prefecture. We do not grow our own rice, but we try to be as local as possible. So 95% of our rice comes from within Nagano Prefecture. As you can see, it comes in on these giant bags. There's between one and two tons of rice in each of those bags. We take those bags and we winch them. You see that? Take that winch, move it over here. That's a hopper that collects the brown rice and moves it into the polishing plant. So we're gonna go inside the polishing plant here for a second, and give you a look. Woo hoo, everybody with me? Yep, we're still here. So you just saw that brown rice outside. It goes down the hopper, comes in here, goes up, and then moves along this way. Now, this is a really big building, and it basically has two sides. The side where the rice comes in, the brown rice, this side is for cleaning the rice. Now, it comes in pretty clean, but we have to make super sure there's no metal parts in there. And a lot of times you get nuts and bolts falling off the tractors and things. You got to separate the rice from all of that nasty stuff. So this is the cleaning side. Then we move the brown rice over here. This is the polishing side. This is where we mill down the outside of the rice. Now this is one of our eight polishers. They are really big. They do a super good job. I'll show them all. Here we go. Back over here. I'll lose you a little bit, but let's see if we can get you. So that gives you an idea. We have eight of these monster machines. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of rice milling. Uh, in this machine, we re generally run it about uh, 1.5 tons to 1.1 tons. Starts brown rice at the top, comes down to this green section. You notice the green section is round. That's because in there is the polishing stones, which I'll show you right now. So those stones are what is inside of those round housing. The stones spin around real fast and slowly polish the rice. It takes a long time. For example, let me show you a sample. Hey, that's a rhyme. For example, let me show you a sample. Here we have some Yamada Nishiki. This is actually from Hyogo. Oops, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, they just warned me we're gonna get run over by a fork of it, so everybody duck. <laughs> Brown rice, that's what goes in. About 60 hours later, 35% remaining, that's what comes out. So that gives you the whole picture of polishing from start to finish. These machines do a wonderful job. Now, I want to say one thing about polishing. That is, the reason we polish is so that we can get a better balance in the sake. What kind of balance? Balance between the two main things that are in rice. Obviously, you have lots of starch. That's nice. But you also have a lot of protein. Protein is on the outside. What you're trying to do with polishing is reducing protein. The reason why is protein does not become sugar and alcohol. During fermentation, protein becomes amino acids and acids. Now, amino acids are great because they produce that umami feeling, the savory feeling. But too much amino acid is really harsh, really bitter. So you got to bring the balance between the sugar and alcohol and the amino umami side. That's why we polish. Okay? Now, don't worry. This makes a lot of flour. Red flour from the outside and two grades of white flour. All of this flour is used. The local farmers use the red flour. The flour comes out here. We cook it up in bags. Local farmers use the brown flour, the red flour, and then we have brokers that buy all the white flour because they make uh, rice confections, rice crackers, and all that fun stuff. All righty, moving right along. After you're done polishing, you have to wash. Now here we do all premium level, and so we need to wash in a premium way. Uh, I'll turn my phone around here a little bit so you can kind of get me an idea. Are, are you still with me? We're good? Yep, we're good. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when I mean premium, I mean doing it in small batches because when you wash and soak, 
you want to make sure, one, you get all of the rice powder, the, the protein powder off the rice, but then you want to make sure that there's just enough water content that soaks back into the rice. And it's very delicate. Normally, we're going to do this on the floor using a strainer and a little rice water, rice and water, and a bucket. Well, that takes everybody, all hands on deck, and it's just way too labor intensive to try to do that with everything in your brewery. So what we decided to do is put in these wonderful pieces of automation. What this does is it washes and soaks in small batches, same small batches that you do by hand, but this robot will do it all, and it only takes one guy to kind of make sure that everything stays on track. It really increases our consistency, it increases the quality, uh, and it lowers the amount of labor that goes into it. So we're all happy with all of that. The, the proper application of technology is something that all good brewers do. Now, when the rice comes out of this soaker, it comes out of the conveyor, what we do is we put it into boxes with wheels, and we move it to this. This is an elevator that move, we put the boxes in there. You can see some boxes in there right now. Then we move that up to the second floor and the second floor is where the next step, steaming happens. So I'm gonna have to move to the second floor now and I'll probably lose you guys. The Wi-Fi is a little spotty as I move up to the second floor. Um, so you guys can do a little chit chat while I'm getting myself over there. Oh, by the way, this is a wonderful, this is our Mars sake production test project. We're going to put a sake brewer in there and then send him to Mars. Not really, no. It just looks so futuristic. Uh, this is water conditioning. We have pure water up here. It's great. But we need to condition the mineral content to make it exactly fit with the Sua Brewery. So Fujimi Brewery here in the mountains, Sua down on the town, has exactly the same mineral content. So again, we might lose Keith as he's walking through here. But again, as you, as you move into different areas of the brewery in order to... Uh... To keep it keep it sanitary, uh, you know they they'll uh, sanitize their their hands, their boots. They put on different boots or different shoes for different areas, and so that's what Keith was just doing. He was walking through there. We're uh, now headed upstairs. Well, he'll show us some more things. But uh, Liloa, this is a this is a pretty pretty big pretty pretty big brewery in the sense of its size. You know they were lucky that they were able to build a larger space up there, um, and and be able to have have quite a lot of things that they can accomplish. So it, it's pretty cool. I've been, again, I've been up to that brewery as well. Uh, and when you go in person, it's a, it's a pretty long tour right now. Keith is, is hustling through, uh, to get us, to get us back, back in space and welcome back, Keith. Where are you now? Oh, am I back? Oh, great. Hi guys again. So I'm going to take the cart cam here and show you comes out of the elevator. There's Master Brewer Nakano and Nakano Zambandi. Hi, hey, say hello. So, cart cam, we take the rice over here, and that. So you get an idea. So, you got the soaked rice. You got your steamers, these beautiful round things. And again, I mentioned winch before. Winches are actually super important because they allow you to move a lot of rice pretty easily. Up on the ceiling there, you have this beautiful winch system. So winches pick the rice up in these net, net bags that fit perfectly inside the steamer. Then you put the lid on the steamer. So what you can do basically is put as many layers as you want of the rice in the net bags, steam it up after you get the lid on it for about 50 minutes. That's five zero minutes. When it's done, you use the winch to remove the net bag and winch it over here. This will be cooler and drier. So the rice comes out steamed and pretty hot. You put it in here, moves through the cooler. It gets cool, obviously. And we also dry it out. It comes out on this side, and it falls into another blue cart. From there, the rice goes wherever you plan to take it. I should mention, there's a lot of plans to take it. You've got a rice jar here. They already erased it, but it, the rice is going everywhere. One of the most important places the rice has to go is into the koji room in order to make the koji. 
So you just wheel your card over to the Koji room and in she goes. Let me show you the Koji room up close here. They're gonna kill me, I stole their card. So inside the Koji room, as many of you know, what you're doing with about 20% of the steamed rice is you're growing a particular type of fungus or mold on it called, uh, not Aspergillus orizae, but most people here call it Koji. It takes a little over two days First day in the big round tub at the end there, that's to get the koji growing well. Second day, you move it and split it into two pieces and put it in these beds. They look like beds too. And then you work with it for another day to get it to grow just right, get it to grow into the center of the rice. And then on the third morning, you take it out into the cold brewery and there it is. That's finished koji right there. Now what the koji has been doing is making enzyme that breaks the sugar down Break that starch down to sugar. Starch to sugar, again, super important because the sugar is what gives the yeast something to eat and turn into alcohol. Very Alrighty. nice. Now, this gives you a little idea. You saw our big koji room. That's where we do large volumes. But we also have a little koji room next door. In there, we don't use those big tubs. We use these things. They're called koji buta. So we do individual lots of koji in these tiny wooden pallets. Uh, and you get an idea. It goes in. Actually, the koji itself, the mold comes to us in this form. It, it's kind of a grayish green powdery substance. And the powder is actually the koji seeds or spores. We sprinkle that on and then let her go. Now, once you've got your koji, you're ready to start yeast fermentation. The first thing you do is you start in a small way. We always start small and grow big here. The first thing you do is go to this room. These are the most important ja uh, Japanese characters to know. That's the character for sake, but here you read it as shu. This is the character that's the most important. This is the character for mother. So this is sake's mother's room. Shubo shitsu. Shubo shitsu. Uh, it's really where the mother of all sake starts. Let's take a look. Hmm. It always smells so good in here. You got all that fruit ester flying out of these tanks. Um, and right now we're, we're doing a, a whole series. Most of our shubo, most of our starters are about 10 days to start. And then we move the whole thing into the next stage. Into these tanks, what you get is first koji, uh, the finished koji rice, water. And then you're gonna let that dissolve. So those enzymes that break starch and sugar get into the water. Then you add the steam rice along with the yeast, get it all mixed up in there and you let her go and you keep temperature control real well for 10 days, unless it's a Yamahai. We'll be talking about Yamahai in a little bit. Yamahais are much longer um, process for making the starter. So once you get a starter going, the next step is to add more stuff to it. Basically, you start small and then you grow the size of the mash or the moromi. To do that, you need a bigger room. This is our big moromi space. This is the main fermentation space, but there aren't any tanks. There's a couple of little ones, but nothing else. That's because we're looking from above down at very large tanks that are attached to the floor. After starter, the next tank size is this. So the first addition of water, steam rice, and koji is in this medium-sized tank. You put it in there, you mix it up, the starter gets happy, the yeast get happy, three days, and then at the bottom of the tank is a valve. You open that valve and you put everything down in the big tank. Once it's in a big tank, you add more rice, more water, more koji, two more times, three times all together, and it's a home run. You got the full thing going. This fermentation process takes about 30 days. 30 days, sometimes longer. And right here, this guy is just, he's, it's perfect. There he goes. He's just finished filtering out this. So today we were filtering, and this was just gone out to the filter, which is where we're gonna head next. You still with me, guys? We're with you. So uh, it looked like on top of each one of those tanks, there were like little fans. Is that to break down the bubbles? Exactly. 
the fans are on a couple of the tanks that are using a type of yeast that makes lots of bubbles. It's a foaming yeast. And we got some other tanks that don't have the fans because some of the yeast we use are not foaming. This guy over here is just checking some uh, temperature stuff. And this one doesn't have the fan because this uses a type of yeast that does not foam. Cool. All right, off to pressing. Here we go. And boy, I feel really pressed to get to pressing. We're going to go down the stairs. And I'm probably losing. Yep, no worries. He's, yep. he's, uh, he's going to get back to us in a quick second. But yeah, Liloa, it's interesting. Some, some sakes are foaming. Uh, some yeasts are foaming yeasts and some aren't, which is hence why we have those fans and then sometimes not those fans. Uh, you being from Hawaii, you might know this, but uh, the discovery of non-foaming yeast it happened in Hawaii. Pretty low. I mean, the zero, like, I know they, they're indicated by zero one. Was, was that from Nihei-san? Did he discover that? Oh, hi, guys. That was Nihei-san who discovered that. Welcome back, Keith. Okay. Let's take a look. We might even get some, some love here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You see that? So those panel filters bring that sake through, filter it out, and the beautiful sake comes in here. I'm going to just give you a little idea. So that's what it's, that's what it's about. So this is freshly, freshly filtered or pressed sake. Uh, I'm going to ask Nakano Toji what we're doing this morning. So this is Arabashiri. This is uh, Katsuhiko also showed you the bottle. So this is our winter to spring, um, beautiful seasonal Shiboridate Namagenshu. And we're just filtering in Fujimi for the first time for this product. So anyway, you guys will be seeing that in a couple of months. Kampai! Before we start the tasting, uh, Keith, uh, why don't we have uh, Nakano Toji uh, say hello and introduce himself? Good idea. Good idea. So, Totodaki, Jiko Shokai, Onigashimas. No, Mina San Konicha. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So this is uh, Nakano Toji's sixth year as the master brewer for this facility here in Fujimi. So, so every year, every year I improve a little bit. Every year I work harder to improve again. There you go. That's good to hear. Hi, Liloa, can you tell us a little about this? Sure. So, Miyasaka Yawaraka Junmai, you know, I think it's pretty cool how Chris came up with the name Sake Matane. So, this one comes in at um, 12%, which is relatively low for um, a sake, being that most sake is coming around 15 to 17%. And um, I fell in love with this years ago because it was so soft and really approachable and if you notice what's cool about this this is a junmai um but yet you look if you look at the polishing ratio is 55 percent and this just dances on your palate i mean it's light it's kind of tippy toes across your palate when you're drinking it i mean it's almost like drinking spring water go i mean it's gorgeous you get subtle hints of wild plum um there's just a nice silkiness to it so for those of you who don't have it, we'll you know have some back here pretty soon in a couple of weeks. But yeah, this was this is great for a lot of um, wine drinkers because of the low ABV. And when they first came out with this, I, you know I do know that a lot of people were able to transition from wine to um, Yawaraka Junmai because, specifically because of that. And the interesting thing about this is that it's actually I'll let Keith go into the specifics obviously, but this is actually a blend of different levels of alcohol sake with different levels of alcohol but i was always intrigued with the fact that it, it just comes across so so soft and easy and approachable and a lot of my accounts do really well with this one uh fantastic all right uh keith and nakano told you can you just tell us a little bit about um why uh why you chose to do um the lower alcohol how how we came about that and a little bit about the background of this wonderful sake okay i thought you think the この、まあ、あの、その時は、じゅん、純米、柔らかい純米だったけど、うん、あの
、どうやって結局、12度の増水ができたかっていうことは、そう、減収があって、はいはい、それを 12% に割ったときに、うん、なんかあの、バランスのいい感じ、これ,これがそうなんだけど、バランスのいいあの数値になるように、なんかそういう。企画があったの昔、はい、でその工房は特別な工房だったんですよ、ね、昔はね、はいうん、今はもう7号1個でやるけど。So、um, he was explaining that、uh, they wanted to go to 12%, and、uh, to get there, you're going to have to, you have to dilute with water anyway. All sake, almost all sakes are, are diluted with water. But if you dilute too much, then you lose a lot of the balance. So, They needed to work out a way to do it without losing that balance, and they decided it would be a combination of blending two different、um, batches、uh, with two different yeast and then adding water in order to get the right balance of flavor and aroma and 12% alcohol. They at that time had a special yeast that they, they had developed here that helped them get to 12 because that yeast finished the、um, regular fermentation, the lower alcohol content. And so they were able to blend that lower alcohol Genshu, which is、uh, the full strength, with another product and get just the right balance after adding water. Now, the ones you have in the States now, this lovely thing, is still done in that way. But Nakano san has been working hard. He would rather do this straight up without using this kind of old and, and not, so,、uh, not, not so behavior,、um, but not for, it doesn't behave well, the, the yeast that we're using. So, he wanted to be able to do this with a more typical yeast, and he's been working on it. So, from the next batches this next year coming, it's not going to be some special fancy yeast. It's going to be number seven yeast that we're working on, plus, it won't be blended. He's going to actually do this with no blend. He's going to get a Genshu at around 13, and then adding water is not going to be difficult at all. So, coming up in the next couple of years, you'll, you'll see these developments actually appearing in your bottle. Fantastic. That's amazing.、Uh, Craig, how about we move on to the next sake? What are we tasting next? We are going to go with the benchmark Masumi's Okuden Kansukuri, or the Mirror of Truth. And <laughs> the idea behind the name is that if a Junmai sake could stand up and look at itself in the mirror, this is exactly what it would see. <clears throat> and it's made with yeast number seven,、uh, which obviously, as we've discussed, is, is one of the most dramatic. Components that Masumi has given to the sake world. And the interesting thing about this is not that we put a whole lot of stock in the SMV for rating a sake, but it actually rates a zero on the scale. And zero is equivalent to water. So this is sort of like Mizukami or the water, the god water. And I love the aromas. It's like poached fruit, mushroom, earthy notes. Just a super delightful benchmark. And also,、uh, according to my wife, who I always have to mention, worked in a rather famous sushi restaurant in New York City for 15 years. Whenever anybody came in, they didn't really have a great grasp on sake, but they said they wanted a dry sake. She would give them Masumi Okuden, and 100% of the time they were happy with it. So you can have it on your table for Thanksgiving. Remember, those of you who have the sake, this is the, bo the bottle.、Uh, if you're moving on to the second sake, just you, just you know the label.、Uh, Keith and Nakatoji, can you carry us through a little bit of the story about Masumi Mirror of Truth? And Dave, can you play the PowerPoint? Basically, this is a shot of the Sua Taisha Shrine. This is a big Shinto shrine that's in our town. It's a really important shrine for Japan. And、um, Shinto religion relies on sake for lots of its rituals. So, a lot of the local mayors, makers of sake provide the sake to the shrine. Now, if Dave wants to click once, you can see that barrel there on the left. Just give one click there, Dave. You can see that's a Masumi sake barrel. So, because this shrine was getting sake from the Masumi Miyasaka family, they gave us the right to use a treasure, a national treasure, which is in this shrine. The treasure's name is、uh, Masumi no Kagami. If we want to click to the next slide, we'll have a picture of it, I think. So, this object, this treasure, Masumi no Kagami,、um, is where our name came from. If you click through, you can see basically Kagami means mirror.、And、this is an ancient mirror, about、uh, 1100 years old. And Masumi means transparent in the sense of totally truthful, completely honest. So, it became the mirror of truth. 
For us, this Okudin is our mirror of truth. It's our Junmai, so it's the base note. It forms the foundation of everything we do here. So it really does deserve the name mirror of truth. It's, uh, it's what says Masumi to most people. This is just such a wonderfully sippable sake. I don't, those of you that do have it, it's just so palatable. It's so enjoyable. Okay. Beautiful roundness, a nice dry finish. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for making this delicious beverage. Um, one quick thing that came up in the, in the chat earlier, we mentioned foaming versus non-foaming. And one of the questions about that was, why would you, what's the decision to use a foaming yeast versus a non-foaming yeast? Um, obviously, non-foaming, you can fit more in the tank. It's easier to clean. But what's the benefits of using a foaming yeast? And that's, you know, for Nakano Toji, if we can answer right. that. Uh, Nakano-san said, basically, this is our first year that he's using the, um, the foamy type. We have normally just used a non-foamy type. That's the ones that have the 01 at the end of their names, like 701. And partly, he wants to use the foaming yeast because... He hasn't done it yet, and he always wants to experiment and try new things. He's heard some good things about them, but he wants to do it himself and see what are the good points of foaming. Even though they are harder to clean and keep the tank sanitary, um, already, now we saw it in the Moromi stage, which is the mash stage. We haven't gotten all the way through to filtering of this um, foamy yeast yet, but already in the Moromi stage, he says the aromas are very, very intense, very good. So he's very pleased with the aromatic wow. aspect, and he's hoping that that continues through to the actual filtering. But uh, we all get to wait and see on that one. I, I think right. that from my experience, when I compare the foaming yeast to non-foaming, it's like lager yeast and ale yeast, right? Ale oh. yeast sits on top of the tank. It's very active. It's very aggressive. So you get sort of that intensity of aroma, whereas lager yeast, it's, you know, it's the trust fund baby. It sits at the bottom, it hangs out, it waits for the pizza delivery. Still makes a nice beer, but they're always lighter, they're less interesting, and there's less depth uh, to them. And I've always thought that way about the yeast. About that. So basically, Craig, it's a great question. Um, he'd love to test that out, but he doesn't know yet. One thing that he does know, um, unlike some beers, the yeast for sake are never identified as top fermenting or bottom fermenting. Well, you know, maybe. Um, they're not, they're not looked at as being uh, sort of living in a certain um, biosome of the whole thing. They, they're mixed throughout. So they don't think of it in terms that you just described is in beer. Cheers again, everybody. Come by. Come by. Come by. Hey, scratch and Sniff app just uploaded. You got that? <laughs> <laughs> Keith, I would love you and uh, Nakano told you to talk a little bit about, about this wonderful sake and and kind of the idea behind it. Obviously, it's called Nanago, which is what we learned earlier today, yeast number seven. If we could show the slide next to. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, as, as CJ just mentioned, Nanago means number seven, the workhorse yeast of the industry. Uh, this is actually inside of our Sua brewery, the one that Katsuhiko was in front of. And in the brewery, we have this black marble plaque commemorating the actual date that the number seven yeast was certified by the uh, Brewing Association, uh, the Brewing Institute um, doctor, Yamada. So this is 1946 is when yeast number seven was certified. Um, it, as, I, as I, we all know, has become the workhorse of the industry, still is used more often than any other sake yeast out there. We are developing some of our own varieties of that now. Um, we find that relying only on the association's version doesn't give us enough latitude, enough flexibility. So we do have our own versions, but basically they're all based on the number seven family. Nanago, as a, as a Jumai Daiginjo, was kind of a pioneer in coming back to number seven for the Daiginjo class. At the time it was developed, which is the early 90s, everybody was making Daiginjo with the, the newer yeast. For example, number nine was the really big one back then. And Masumi did that too. But the master brewers, the president at the time, everybody felt that it was, it was kind of doing a disservice both to the yeast and to the industry to, to make everybody think that Daiyijo should only be made with one type of yeast. So we decided to go back to number seven and it worked out really well. Um, so I will ask Nakano-san uh, what his kind of take on the specifics of this product are. 
Well, very quickly, he said one thing to remember is this is all Nagano. So the rice is, uh, is our own local Miyamanishiki. The yeast is from us with Nagano too, the water obviously. So it's, it's in that way, it's very, very local style of Jumai Daiginjo. It's also a Yamahai, which means we work really hard at starting the, the yeast. And that gives you extra depth in amino acidity, uh, in lactic acidity. So he said, because the aromas from number seven are not so super fruity, it's a great sake to pair with your normal meal. And Nagano people are pretty hometown local people. They have local food. And so they wanted a daiginjo that would work well with, you know, just meat and potatoes, you know, rice and grilled fish, your everyday stuff. And so this really does the trick. Now, you know, you know what's beautiful about this is like, it's, um, I want to say it's rich, but, but yet it's, the, the balance keeps getting in the way. It's, it's so balanced. And oh, even when you warm it up, I, I prefer this room temp. Hitoharakan, maybe Nurukan. Be, cold is nice, but it's just amazing. Just such a versatile socket. Yeah, thanks, Bilo. Actually, Nakano-san saying exactly the same thing. He usually has this room temp. He'll have it a, just a little bit over room temperature. He prefers it that way. So, yeah, you guys are right on. So, with, with Karasumi? <laughs> Uh, I, I think I can, to, to quickly to point out is it historically right sake typically follows the style of cuisine and vice versa so you know you're looking at Nagano you're high up in the mountains you have you know winter vegetables you have game food you know game meats you have preserved foods um, and I think where Nanago really shines through is if you take a different Daiginjo God forbid you should buy anything but Masumi but if you compare Nanago to another Daiginjo, maybe that, you know, uses some newer yeast, it still stands up to being a Daiginjo. Mm -hmm. But then when you eat it with the food, the other Daiginjo is just eliminated. It disappears. It's gone. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the Nanago stands up really well. And we're coming into winter, people. So, hey, stock up. For those of us who are, are here listening, uh, can you just give a brief description of what Yamahai, what Yamahai means um, so that everyone understands exactly when, when we say the word Yamahai, what that translates into what you're tasting in the glass. Okay. Well, basically up there in the brewery, we saw the yeast starter room, the, the sake's mother's room. That's where you make the starter or the moto. The way you make that for Yamahai is different than normal. I mentioned that for regular sakes that take about 10 to 14 days to make the starter, the reason it only takes only takes 10 to 14 is because we add pure lactic acid that we buy from a food supplier. You have a lot of food service suppliers that sell lactic acid. We add lactic acid on the first day and that prepares the tank. It removes all the other bacteria that might mess up the uh, fermentation and we can start in yeast fermentation right away. However, Yamahai, we do not add that lactic acid. We go back to the older method where you grow the bacteria in the tank that make lactic acid. Then when they make enough lactic acid that the yeast are okay, you add the yeast, at least that's what we do, and then you get started. So it takes twice as long. The Yamaha is going to take, you know, between 20 to 30 days to get that started. The results, basically, you can see more lactic character in the sake, so it can be almost cheese-like. It gets a lot more lactic. Also, you get more amino in general. So you get more umami characteristics. And um, some people, depends on how they make it, like Philip Harper down there at Tamagawa, he's an absolute master at doing this. <laughs> you can get some fantastic acidity and that sort of thing. So working with Yamahais can be, uh, you know, it takes a lot of labor, but you get all kinds of interesting depths, all kinds of interesting complexity. A quick question was, how has COVID affected actual sake production? Um, you have to change the way you do things to keep social distancing or masks or anything in that manner that is, has affected the way you brew. Good question. Nakano-san said the actual inside the brewery work has not changed very much at all because they already have to be careful with microbes. So they already wear masks. They already have, you know, hats. They're already sanitizing. The only thing that changes when you come in in the morning to start working, they do a temperature check. And you have to check yourself off as being okay with temperature. Um, that's it. The only change. Keith, can you tell us about 
Hiya Oroshi. Basically, Hiya Oroshi is a style. It's something that's been around for many hundreds of years. Um, it comes out in the fall. Basically, what we're trying to do is preserve a little bit of the fresh and, and beautiful character of sake when it's younger. Um, over the summer, a lot of sake gets beat up during the hot temperatures. They often pasteurize the hell out of it. So what we do is we hold some back in the brewery. We keep it sleeping in a nice, cool location. Sometimes we might even refrigerate it. And then we wake it up in the fall time so that it still has some freshness along with maturity. So it's, it's a great style. And again, I mentioned, uh, for example, Yamaha. We also use the Yamaha uh, yeast starter method for this one. So you get um, all of the things we talked about for Yamaha. Some beautiful lactic notes. You get beautiful acidity. Uh, you get a little more depth. And this all helps with the autumn menu. You're talking about food that is, you know, deep in the woods. You're getting lots of mushrooms in. You're getting root vegetables. All of the meats and fishes have lots more fat in them. So this style of sake is great for that a uh, little bit heavier and richer uh, fall menu. Hey, hey Keith, I, I got to say that that new label is gorgeous. What's the background of the design? Thank you. So uh, Katsuhiko was really happy to introduce that too. So you see there's a kind of round motif in the center. Um, that's yeah. the image of a, of a sake cup. And there's a kind of shape in it, right? That shape is the reflection of a leaf. It's an ivy leaf. Um, and that leaf is actually on the Miyasaka family crest. All of the really old families, like the Miyasaka family was a samurai family back in the day, back in the 15 and 1600s. And so they have this type of leaf. It's called in Japanese sta, sta leaf, which is a Boston ivy. So it's reflecting the family crest leaf in a sake cup. How's that? That's awesome. But as you, drink more, as you drink more, you see the moon in clouds. Or you, <laughs> see, you see the image of the mountains over Lake Sua. So the more that you drink, the more you see in this. Uh, but if you could grab whatever bottle you have, grab your glass, uh, put it up there kind of like this and, and uh, smile. Um, we're going to do that in a few seconds if everybody's ready. All right. Uh, Keith, you guys ready? All right. One, two, three. Everybody yell, Kampai! 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 Kampai!